Well, two weeks ago, we, we started the book of Ruth, Old Testament book, and we actually looked at just at the first seven words in the text. And so we set the background by saying the book of Ruth took place during the period of the judges, a very terrible time when people did evil what was, uh, in, the, in, the, in the sight of the Lord. They did what they, they wanted in their own eyes. And then last week, we kind of took a broad picture and we told the whole story of the book of Ruth. And so today, what I want to do is I want to kind of backtrack and I want to start all over again. Uh, the first verse simply tells us, in the days when the judges ruled, we, we looked at that part. And then our story is introduced with this phrase, when there was a famine in the land. And I've just got to stop and I've got to explain a little bit uh, about this. In an agrarian culture, a uh, famine was devastating. In, a, in an area and a part of the world where even on a good year, the amount of food produced is barely enough, when famine hits... It's a terrifying prospect. Now, what's interesting is you can go and do a study just on famines in the Old Testament. You're going to realize how impactful they were. We can go clear back, for example, to the days of Abraham. Actually, even before his name was Abraham, when his name was still Abram, there was a famine in Israel. And so he went down to Egypt. Or later, we get Isaac and happened to come to terms with a king named Abimelech because of famine. Or, of course, we know the book of Genesis concludes with the story of Joseph. And Joseph's in Egypt, and because of his wisdom and God's Uh, Providence, basically they stored up food for seven years to provide for a seven-year famine. And so we go through the the, the stories in the Old Testament, we realize famines were a big deal. And usually when we think famine, usually we think drought, we think lack of rainfall. Uh, But I want to maybe stop and change your thinking a a little bit. That's not the only cause of famine. Not only can drought cause famine, but we also know that maybe insects cause famine. But also think of one other thing. Think of invaders. Uh, think of marauding invaders who come and destroy towns and cities and villages and, uh, and rape and plumage the land and destroy crops. And that actually might be the best way to think about the story as we get to the book of Ruth. We, we realize Israel during the time of the judges undergoes many times where there are these invading armies that come and they really do destruction to the land. But whatever the cause of the famine... We realize this little sleepy town, Bethlehem, which by the way, Bethlehem's two words in Hebrew. Beth is the word city. Lechem in Hebrew is the word bread. And so we actually get the house of, of bread or the, uh, the city of bread. And so we get this irony that the house of bread actually is going through a famine. And as a result of the famine, we're going to see and be introduced to several characters. And what I want to do this morning is I want to stop and look at these characters and kind of tell their story And maybe even find ourselves in their stories. We're going to see different levels, if you will, of commitment and faith in the story. So if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, we're going to start over again. Ruth chapter 1. Notice as we begin, just the first five verses. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a a famine in the land. A man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. And his wife's name, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah, the other Ruth. And they lived there about ten years. Both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. We get introduced to this guy named Elimelech. Now, we've learned already what his name means. His name actually means, my God is king. And we realize a famine comes on the land. And so because of the famine, he decides to take his wife and his sons to, to Moab. And, and really, we can understand this, can't we? There's a famine in the land. He's struggling to, 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 to survive. And so he does what he has to. And we, we think about that, especially in our day and age. We think you've got to do whatever it takes to provide for your family. And so we might not be shocked at the story, but we should be. You see, he actually, he takes his family and he makes a very questionable decision. He goes to a place called Moab. Now, let me just put this thing in perspective. Moab. And I want to ask this question, Why? Why Moab? If you look at a map, and I've got a map here of Israel for you, and you see Bethlehem, just, just south of Jerusalem, and just across the Dead Sea, we, we see an area called Moab and the traditional home of Ruth, uh, uh, Madaba. 
And we look at this map, and first thing I want you to know, it's not very far. In fact, as the, as the crow flies, it's about 35 miles. If you make your way around the Dead Sea to the, to the north and come back down, it's about 50 miles. And so the first thing we need to point out is climate's not much different there. And probably if there's a famine due to drought, both areas are going to be influenced by that. And so that's the reason I say it's not always just a, a drought that, that causes famine. And we realize there's Moab. But here's what we need to remember. Moab's not very far. Moab's also uh, around the Dead Sea. And my first question for you is, I wonder why Moab? You see, there's a lot of places within Israel a person could go. In fact, you'd go the same distance to the west. And a person could be there on the Mediterranean, a place where we know it's known for its, its crops and its fruit and all kinds of things. There's water there. There's fish. You could, you could move about the same direction to the west and go by the Mediterranean, be a great place. Or you could actually stay in Israel and you could go just a little bit farther to the north in this place called the Sea of Galilee. Again, all kinds of water and fish and things like that. And so actually a person could stay in Israel and relocate. But Elimelech doesn't do that. He actually goes outside of Israel to Moab. And here's what you need to understand when you read this. Moab is actually Israel's enemy. Moab's maybe part of the reason for the famine. You see, it's during this time, during the judges, where the Moabites come in and take over, and they raid, and they pillage, and they rape the land. And it may even be the, the, the Moabites that have caused this famine in the land of Israel. And here's what Elimelech does. He moves to Israel's enemies. Now, this, this hate relationship, it stems way back. We can go back, clear back to the Genesis, and we realize Lot has an incestuous relationship with his daughter. There's two children that, that are... are are, are, are bred from that, if, if you will. We get Moab and, and Ammon. We get the Moabites and the Ammonites. And let me just tell you that the, the Jews, the Moabites and the Ammonites, they've been fighting. In fact, they're still fighting. And imagine that. The, this man who's a leader in the community, he leaves Israel. And he just doesn't go somewhere else in Israel. He actually goes and he moves to Israel's enemies. He goes, well, he goes and lives among the Moabites. If we remember our Bible stories, that the, the Moabites have never been friendly to Israel. In fact, we can go back again in the, the Old Testament, the first five books. We can read a story about Balak. He's king of Moab, and he actually hires a, a diviner to bring a curse on Israel. That's how much they loved each other. Now, the guy he tries to hire, his name's Balaam, and Balaam has this donkey that's much smarter than he is. Maybe you can go back and read the story of Balaam's donkey, and you'll realize the story there. But remember, it's the Moabites who try to curse the, the Israelites. Or I've already told a story a couple of weeks ago about Eglon, this great big fat king. He's the guy that came in, and for 18 years, he oppressed Israel. In fact, it's probably even during this time, the, the reign of Eglon, that the story of Ruth takes place. And so we realize there's a Moabite king oppressing the land. Not only that, we should stop and realize that the Moabites worshiped a different god. His name's Kamush. And you can read in the Bible where people actually sacrificed human sacrifices to the Moabite god. And so you couldn't get any more dramatically opposed to, to, to Judaism than the, the Moabites. And this is the place that, that he moves he goes and he takes his family to a place, they're enemies of Israel, they worship a false god, a, fa a god who demands human sacrifice. The Moabites, really they're such a wicked people, an evil people, that the Bible actually says that the Moabites for 10 generations cannot come and be part of the practice of worship in Israel. And Elimelech, whose name means, my God is king, he actually goes and he takes his family to this place. And I've got to stop and say, this is certainly a questionable decision. And let me tell you just a few more things about Elimelech that might, might be helpful uh, to you. Uh, first of all, I just want to stop and say he was a respected leader. He was a land owner. He was probably wealthy. And we get clues to that. Not only does he own land, we also realize that, that Naomi is going to say, hey, I went out of this place full and I came back empty. And probably talking about the amount of wealth she, she had. But what we read and what we learn about him, he's, uh, he's apparently more concerned about prosperity than he is godliness. He really is more concerned about taking an easy way out than really sticking with something and doing things the hard way. He really is thinking, hey, I can go and life could be easier in this foreign land. Even though it's an ungodly land, even though it's a God, uh, land that, that, that God hates because of the people and the practices there, we realize that he actually says, I think I'll go over there instead. In fact, just go back and read 
Read Jewish literature and you'll find how unkind Jewish literature is to Elimelech because he's a traitor. He goes to this God-forsaken area. He goes and lives among those kind of people because he's more concerned about finances than, than he is godliness. And his move, there's, there's, no, there's no indication that he consults God. I wonder what would have happened. He said, hey, God, what would you like me to do? Where would you like me to go? There's no indication of that. And likely, he not only turned his back on God, but the truth of the matter is he probably he lacked faith. The, the, the truth of the matter is he probably abandoned worship of Yahweh, the, the true God of Israel, even before this time. And the way we know that, he's got two children. And it's interesting, you look at the names of the two children, Malon and Kilion, let me just tell you this. They're not Hebrew names. They're not Jewish names. They're actually Canaanite names. And so even when he has children, notice what he does. He doesn't name them Hebrew names. He names them names of the Canaanites. And so uh, we realize that uh, he, really, he really wasn't trying to be faithful to God. I stop and I think about his decisions. And I just wonder if these things ever crossed his mind. I wonder if he ever thought, what would be the ramifications of my faith if I moved to this place? I wonder if he ever stopped and thought, I wonder what the ramifications for my children growing up in a pagan nation would be. I wonder if he ever stopped and thought, if I move there, who will my sons marry? Did he ever realize that if he goes to a foreign country where they worship foreign gods, that his, his, his sons would probably marry, marry foreign women? That's not the problem, but foreign women who worship foreign gods. Did he ever think about that? Did he ever think about the fact that, hey, if something happened to me, I'm taking my family, and they'd be in a nation that would be unprovided for because the Moabites, they don't take care of widows and orphans. If anything happened to me, what would happen to my family? He, he never seems to, to answer those questions. And so he makes decisions, questionable decisions, and he goes, and they, they wreak havoc on his family. Let me just stop and say, that's how our decisions are as well. Decisions we make often affect the future, and we should be thinking th things through about what job we, we take and where we work and how it'll affect our kids, and if the new job will, will keep us too far away from our family or those type of things. We should stop and ask God, God, what is it you would like me to do? But it seems like Elimelech doesn't think any of those things. And so because of his decisions, Naomi is left widowed and childless in a situation that places them in... Well, deprivation and despair. The problem is Elimelech wore this name. Elimelech, my God is king. He wore the name, my God is king, but he did not wear it well. I want to tell you, he made some terrible decisions. And because of that, he put his family in jeopardy. And we go on, and because of those decisions, we actually are introduced to a second character in our story. Her name's Naomi. Now, Naomi's name means pleasant. And I want you to read as we read in this chapter about Naomi. She goes through a very bitter experience because of the decisions of her husband. And I want to take up the story in verse 6. When she heard Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the, the place where she'd been living and set out for the road, and, uh, the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you've shown to your dad and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. She kissed them and they wept aloud and said to her, we'll go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why, why should you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could be coming your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it's more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. Now, I want to skip down to verse 18. We're going to come back to verse 14. Excuse me, verse 19. So the, the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the, the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't, don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth, the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem, as the barley harvest was beginning. We get Naomi. Again, she's been widowed and stranded in this foreign country. 
uh, they, they left Bethlehem when there's a famine. And now a decade later, things are going well again in, in Israel. And she hears about this and she realizes things are going well there. But not only that, if I was back in my homeland, at least God has provided provision for, for widows and, and, and things like that. And so she realizes that things would be better at home. Uh, God, God made provision for people in her situation. So she heads back. What's interesting about our story is if you begin reading this, At first, they leave where they were living. They're on the way back to Israel, and both both daughters-in-law have actually joined her. That's interesting. I mean, we we know these mother-in-law, daughter-in-law type stories, but they're both accompanying her back. It's on the way as she's back, she realizes what she's doing to her daughters-in-law. She's going to be taking them from their home and from their country, a place where their, their skin tone is going to be different, a, a place where their language is different, a place where they're going to be viewed as outsiders. She's taking her Moabite daughters back to Israel, a place where the Moabites are hated because of their worship of God and, and this conflict that's been going on. And she realizes the devastating consequences that they might experience if they go back with her to Israel. And so she stops on the road and says, you know what, it'd be better for you to go back home, go back and live Live in your mother's house, an interesting term, by the way. Usually you speak of father's house, but here she's saying, you go back and, and, and live with your, your mother. Maybe you can find husbands to marry, and it would be much better for you there. And the interesting part of the story is both the daughters, at first they say, no, we want to go with you. Isn't that interesting? And they want to leave their family and their people and their culture and their religion. They want to follow Naomi, which I think speaks a little bit about, about who Naomi is. She really has lived up to her name. Her name means pleasant. And they're saying, we'd rather go with you and even, even leave our family and our friends and our culture and go so we could be with you. But, but Naomi, she stops and says, no, don't, don't go, with, go with me. And she convinces Orpah to go back home, but not until, not until Orpah has, has hugged her and they've wept together. She, she, she loves her mother-in-law. And there's something that's gone on as, as, as we realize that Ruth is even willing to stay. And she is willing to go back with Naomi. And she's willing to leave everything that she's known to go and stay with, with Naomi. And I've, I've got to stop and say, I think Naomi has had a significant influence on her life. Why would she be willing to do that? Well, Naomi, she not only has been pleasant... But she's left a lasting impression on these, these people. I think it speaks to the character of Naomi, that Ruth would be willing to go back with her to a foreign land. Now, Naomi has obviously taught Ruth about God. Naomi has obviously shared stories with her about her God. And so Ruth is saying, look, I want to come back and I want to be part of, part of your family and I want to be, let your God be, be my God. As they make the journey, Naomi is understandably bitter. How could she not be? I mean, she's lost her husband. She's lost two, two adult children, her two sons. And she's angry. But what I want you to notice in this story is she's angry and she's bitter, but she has not lost her faith in God. And I want to stop and say, you know, it's okay. She actually, in this story, she cries out to God, God, why are you doing this to me? She really has come to a crisis in her faith where she believes in God, but she's saying, God, this isn't fair. This is more than I can bear. In fact, she's even wanting to change her name. I want to change my name from, from pleasant. I want to change my name to bitter because God has done all these things to me. And so she's going through a tough time and she's angry. And I want to stop and say, it's okay. She serves a God that's big enough to handle it. In fact, I'd suggest to you, for some of you, maybe you've gone through hardship. And if you haven't, I bet you will. We, we serve a God who's big enough that can handle our complaints. We, we serve a God who can handle our criticism. We serve a God who, who's, he's got broad shoulders, if you will. And he's willing, in fact, he would rather have us complain to him than for us not to talk to him. You don't believe me? Read through the book of Psalms. And read some of the Psalms of David where David is crying out to God. He's pointing his finger at God and saying, God, why are you doing this to me? He complains against God. He says, God, why are you allowing my enemies to prosper? And look where I am. You see, David, David has times in his life when he is angry at God, and yet the Bible records these words, that David is a man after God's own heart. I want to tell you, Naomi has gone through some tough times, and she's bitter, and understandably so. But her God's a great God, and she has not given up faith in him. In fact, I want you to notice that even in her short dialogue, six times in her short dialogue, she mentions the word Lord. 
Now, I've got to tell you again, I've told you this before, but anytime in the Old Testament you see the word Lord in all capital letters, and you're going to see it six times just from Naomi in this passage in all capital letters, Actually, that is the unpronounceable name of God. It's actually in, in, in Hebrew, the, the, the name that a good Jew would not even pronounce. It's the, it's the name Yahweh. And through all this, she's talking about God. Here's who God is. And six times in the story, she uses the name of God. Now, a good Jew, instead of, instead of saying Yahweh, would actually say the word Adonai. And so they would even put the, the vowels of the word Adonai above the consonants of the word Yahweh to, to remind them to, uh, to say Adonai instead of saying God. And so the word Adonai in Hebrew, it's actually the word Lord, which is why our Bibles, when we come to translate this word, they don't translate it God, they translate it Lord in all caps, following this tradition of a good Hebrew, not pronouncing the name of God. But notice continually she says, Here's what the Lord is doing. Here's what the Lord's doing. But not only does she use the word Lord, I want to point out another word that's used twice by Naomi. It's the word Almighty. Now, you probably recognize this. The word Almighty is actually the word Shaddai, which is really interesting because outside the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, in those first five books, the Pentateuch, Shaddai is used over and over and over again. But outside of that book, they're not used very often. Here we find the word Shaddai. You probably recognize the phrase El Shaddai. El is the word God, Shaddai, Almighty. And here she says, she's complaining, but here's who, who Almighty is. What's really interesting to me, at least, about that word Shaddai is we don't really know exactly where it comes from. It's got something to do with a high mountaintop. And so the word Shaddai, its etymology is a little unclear to us, but it means something about strength and majesty and the highness of God. And so here in the passage, it's translated Almighty, It's this mountain-like stability. It conveys the idea of God's unchanging faithfulness, that God's dependable. And so here's what's so interesting. Naomi, she's gone through a very difficult stretch. She's gone through a decade where she's lost her husband and her two sons. And she's understandably bitter. But through it all, she still believes in God. In fact, she even uses this language that God's still dependable, God is still almighty, that God's still in control, that he is this high mountaintop refuge. And so even though it, it appears that Naomi, she really is, she's at the very end of her rope, but she's not given up faith in God. And I want to tell you, even though Naomi has gone through a crisis in faith, and although she's at a very low point in her life where she even wants to change her name to, to bitter rather than pleasant, even though Naomi is at the end of a rope and at the point of almost wanting to give up on God, we're going to find out God's not willing to give up on her. You see, God is almighty. God is Shaddai. And, and so here we find her at a crisis moment, a bitter experience. We're going to find out that God's going to use her and, and bless her. And so as she's at the very end of a rope, we're actually introduced to her daughter-in-law, and here we come to the hero in our story. We, we come to, to Ruth. And an interesting journey. Ruth, a Moabitess, and yet from something that's happened and through the, the testimony really of Naomi in 10 years, she's got a growing faith. And I want to take you back to the part that I skipped in our story. Let's return back to verse 14. This, this point, they wept again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. If you don't mind writing in your Bibles, that, that'd be a good one to underline, that word clung Look, Naomi, uh, said Naomi, your, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where, where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I'll stay. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I'll die. And there I'll be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you from me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. It's interesting because, again, we realize, and several times in the story, it's pointed out to us again and again and again, Ruth's a Moabitess. And what's so interesting about this to me in the story is, we remember it's placed in the time of the judges, where even the Israelites, they're just doing whatever's right in their own eyes. They're doing what's evil in the sight of God. During the period of the judges, the Israelites aren't very faithful. The Israelites aren't demonstrating much faith. And yet, here's somebody that's outside of Israel. She's a Moabite, and she's... She's got this growing faith. There's been something in Naomi that's pointed her to God and how God is dependable and trustworthy. She's probably heard stories of 
of Israel conquering the promised land and things that have gone on and the great God of Israel. And so here's a Moabitess who actually is demonstrating a great deal of faith. She's watched and observed Naomi and she's heard stories about this conquering people. But she's no, she knows that Naomi's God can be counted on. And so when asked to go, she says, yeah, I'm going. When asked to leave, she says, of course not. Where you go, I'm going. And we find this word that I had you underline. It's this word cling. It's an interesting word. It's, it's verb form, which is used here. It does mean to cling or to adhere. Its noun form is literally the word glue. And what's interesting about that is she's willing to say, look, you're stuck with me. I'm going with you. You're not getting rid of me. And she says, I'm going to stick together with you like glue. What's interesting about that word, it's also the same word used in the Old Testament of marriage. In fact, a man's to leave his, uh, leave his, his mother, a woman's supposed to leave her home. The two are supposed to become one flesh, and they're supposed to be stuck together. It's that very same word. And that's the, that's the word that Ruth is using here. Look, you're stuck with me. And here in a, in, a, in a day and age, back in the time of the judges, where people are just doing whatever they want, they're doing what they see fit in their own eyes when they're, really, when they're really just doing what pleases them. Ruth is showing this steadfastness, this determination, saying, look, I'm with you no matter what. And I, I, I start to compare her with Elimelech, Elimelech whose name is my God is King, who really is saying, hey, enough about God. I'm going to go and do what I want. He's really trying to take the easy way and say, look, I can go over there and things will be easier for me. I can make a good living. Yeah, it's in the, in the country of my enemies. And yeah, it's in a place where they worship a foreign God who demands human sacrifice. But look, it'll be easy for me there. And here we find Ruth. And Ruth realizes this journey will not be easy. But it's the right thing to do. And she demonstrates this steadfastness, this loyal commitment not only to Naomi, but to Naomi's God. Look, I'm going to go and I'll even die with you if that's what God wants. And we see Ruth, unlike Elimelech, not taking the easy way, but sticking to it. And we actually see because of that, it's Ruth's loyalty which brings hope and trust back to Naomi. It's Ruth that, again, ignites the, the spark in Naomi to bring back her to this place where she really is Naomi, not Mara anymore. This lady that really is a, a fearer and lover of God. And it's Ruth that actually is able to speak into the life of Naomi and re, rekindle her affection, which is really interesting. In this book, in a period when people just did what was right in their own eyes, we find a lady saying, I'm going to do the right thing no matter what. And it's that kind of person that God's going to, it's kind of, God's going to use, not only to change the life of Naomi, but to change the course of history. And it's through, it's through Ruth where we're going to get King David, and it's through Ruth that we're eventually even going to get the Messiah, Jesus. And we look and, and see, here's the kind of person that God wants to use. And so we're introduced to, to three people, Elimelech, a very questionable, poor decision, Na Naomi, a, a woman who's gone through a very bitter experience, and Ruth who's really saying, Naomi, where you go, I go, and your God, your God's going to be my God no matter what. And I, I, wanna, I want you to just stop, and I, I want you to think about this for a second, and I bet maybe you can find yourself in this story. And so I, I just want to stop, and I want to stop and think about these things, and the first one may be a little bit difficult, but I want to think about Elimelech. Elimelech really is, he's, he's the master of his own fate. He's making his own decisions. He doesn't appear to be, be seeking God and his counsel. Let me just ask you this. Have you really thought through the ramifications of your decisions? Or are you saying, hey, I'm going to do my own thing no matter what? You see, there's no evidence that Elimelech ever stops and says, I wonder what God would have me do. And so he's going to go and provide for his family. He's going to move his family. He's going to take his kids and his wife into a foreign country and foreign gods. He doesn't think through this, pro this process at all. And maybe this should be a warning to us. When it comes to providing for your family, have you stopped and said, is this really what God wants me to be doing? When, when you're thinking about where your kids are going to be raised, if you stop and thought, where would God have me do this, or am I putting my kids in a situation that really is, is not good? When you send your kids to school, or maybe you're sending them away, away to college, do you realize that sometimes the places you're sending your kids are not only going to not help them build faith, but you're sending them places that are going to undermine their faith. They're going to go away, away and marry, marry people that are not God-fearers. Have you thought through those ramifications? Are you any different than Elimelech? Have you really stopped and said, God, what would you have me do? God, where would you have me go? God, what is it you want me to be? Have you made those decisions with him? Have you ever asked? Or are you simply saying, I'm going to do what I want to do, and you're separating, 
You're, you're separating your faith from how you live your life. You see, Elimelech, my God's king, he wore the name, but he didn't wear it well. And I wonder sometimes if we're any different. And then we find Naomi. Naomi, a, a godly woman who, who loved God and yet went through a very bitter time. And maybe that's where you are. Maybe you're in a place where life has been hard and life has kind of crushed in on you, that life has thrown you a curve. And so you're at the point, maybe you're at a point of crisis in faith, and really you're angry at God and you're at a point where you're breaking, uh, you're, you're, you're about done, you're at the end of your rope, and you feel like maybe I could just turn my back on God and walk away. I want to tell you, first of all, it's okay for you to cry out to God and complain. We see precedence for that in Scripture. God's big enough to handle it. But maybe what you need to do is you need to return home. You need to surround yourself with God's people, and you've been living in a foreign land far away from God, and what you need to do is come back and say, I need to live among God's people. I need to live among God's plan. I need to live among God's people who will encourage me and inspire me rather than living in a distant place. And so maybe what you need to do in your times of, of struggles and hardship is actually return back to him and surround yourself with like-minded people who will help you and encourage you on your way. And I'm just wondering, maybe, maybe if there's anybody like, like Ruth, who's saying, God, count me in, no matter what. In good times and bad times, no matter what situation, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna be with you, I'm gonna stick with you like glue. You take me, and even though it's an unknown place and an unknown land and an unknown people, and that's ah, okay, I'm willing to go with you wherever it leads. You see, as we look through the pages of the Bible, it's often just ordinary people who God uses to do the extraordinary things, but it's people from all kinds of storied pasts and backgrounds who simply say, God, I'm going to trust in you, and I'm going to follow you wherever it leads me. I want to tell you, that's what God's looking for. You see, we, we look at the story, and we see, we see Naomi at the end of her rope, uh, you've heard that phrase, right? At the end of your rope. I just want to stop and remind you, if you find yourself at the end of your rope, remember, God Almighty, he's actually on the other end. What you need to do is you need to go back towards him rather than away from him. Would you pray with me? Father, I want to come before you. and Father, thank you for this story so many thousand years ago, and yet we see ourselves in this story. Uh, sometimes we see ourselves just doing our own thing and going our own way without considering the ramifications of our decisions and not even consulting you. Or Father, we see ourselves at times when, when life is hard and we, we find ourselves at the end of the rope. What we need to remember is we've got to depend, we've got to trust in you and say, God, wherever you lead, I'll go. Father, help us demonstrate this, this stick to itiveness. Help us stick to you like glue. And that's our prayer. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen.